And thank you to Dorothy, as always. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Cleveland Park Congregational United Church of Christ. We are an open and affirming congregation, and whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are very welcome here. We love having visitors and invite you to tell us who you are and where you're from. Just click the visitor link in the chat room and I'll send you an email. I'll put the link in in a moment. As you can see, we're back on Zoom for the month of January as we ride out the Omicron wave with the hope that we can return to hybrid worship in February. As a reminder, please make sure your devices are muted. And if you don't have your video turned on or we can't see everyone in your household, please use the chat room to tell us how many people, adults and children are viewing the service. Holly will share the announcements. Good morning, everyone. It's lovely to be here with all of you. Um, this afternoon, the poetry group will meet online at 4 p.m. All poetry lovers are welcome. For more information and or the Zoom link, you can email the church. Tomorrow morning, you're invited to participate in the MLK Peace Walk, beginning at 10 a.m. at the Frederick Drug Douglass Bridge and ending at the Ambassador Baptist Church in Anacostia. The walk will focus on voting rights and reflect the words of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. His quote for the march, human progress is neither automatic nor inevitable. Every step towards the goal of justice requires sacrifice, suffering and struggle, the tireless exertions and passionate concerns of dedicated individuals. If interested, please see the link in the chat room. Tomorrow evening, the Arts and Culture Group will meet at 7.30 p.m. to talk about opera. For details in the link, email Trish. Next Sunday, the Bible Discussion Group, oops, sorry, my screen froze. Next Sunday, the Bible Discussion Group will meet at noon using the worship link to discuss the Epistle of James, chapters one through five. For more information, email DIT. That evening, the Faith Life Group will meet at 5.30 p.m. to discuss a recent NPR podcast, Capitalism, God Wants You to Be Rich, which focuses on the so-called prosperity gospel, which is a very interesting part of American Christianity if you are not familiar with it. This belief system, not held by the UCC, teaches that wealth is a sign of God's favor, the effects of which can be seen in American business politics and social policy. For more information in the Zoom link, email Dan. Finally, we'll meet after church on Sunday, January 30th for our annual meeting of the congregation. Please join us to approve the budget, vote for new lay leaders, receive updates on the capital campaign and racial justice audit, and get a preview of 2022 events. Every voice has a vote and we need yours. So in the congregational system, not only is everyone welcome here, but everyone's vote is very much valued here. And last but not least, um, for those of you that like to pledge online or donate online, um, I just wanted to share that we now have uh, access to a mobile app where you can actually fulfill your pledges on the mobile app. So if you go to our church's website in the donate link, I will put that in the chat um, and I'm actually gonna hold up my phone. There's <laughs> an option um, that says download the free Vanco mobile app from the App Store or Google Play, depending on if you have Apple or 
whatever non-Apple people use. Um, <laughs> Sorry, that was a slight dig, not very Christian. Um, but if you actually click the link that's on our website, it'll go through a step-by-step -step thing of um, how to use the app, how to download it, et cetera. So if you're not, if you have a mobile phone but are not super app heavy, it's it's very clear what to do with that. Thank you so much, Holly. And um, <clears throat> I did put the church donation link in the chat. Um, and you can, of course, always ask John Tishy, our fabulous assistant treasurer, for assistance with anything related to donations. And his email is also in the chat. Um, I want to just, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> forgot to take my Zyrtec this morning. Um, I want to just add on to what Holly said about the annual meeting that I am just so grateful for all of our lay leaders and every single volunteer who helps out to make this church um, be who we are. And um, we, I'm so delighted to say we have a full roster of committee chairs um, and we have, um, I don't wanna say full committees because we could still use some more people for adult programs and communication and technology. So if either of those areas is of interest to you, um, please feel free to let me or Holly know that um, adult programs or communication and technology is of interest to you. Um, but we have a fully uh, staffed, volunteered, personed, whatever, um, children and youth committee, which we have not had in a few years now. So um, for the people who stepped up to um, participate in that, I am very grateful. And all of you parents, please stay tuned for an email that has a doodle poll in it um, so that we can get, um, so that we can choose the best times um, for events to take place. So the more people who participate in that, um, the better idea we'll have of what the best times are to offer our um, children and youth program activities. I should also add that I am hoping to participate in tomorrow morning's MLK walk and invite you to enjoy the image of the Frederick Douglass Bridge that Meg has included on some of our worship slides today. We begin this morning's service by lighting our candle of hope and healing for the world. This morning's worship will celebrate God's grace and abundance amidst any signs to the contrary. Please join me for the call to worship. How precious is your love, O oh God. We feast on your abundance. We drink from the river of your grace. You are the source of all life. Our path is illumined by your light. And together we pray, source of life. We come together this January morning seeking your light. The season of Epiphany promises not just that you are Emmanuel, God with us, but that your appearance will be revealed to us. Help us to recognize your presence in both the miraculous and the mereness of life. Bread, water, work, wine, soil, light, and touch, and grant us the courage to risk opening to your love and grace, the extravagance underlying it all. Please join me for our opening hymn, Arise, Your Light is Come.
I now invite you to join in a time of silent reflection. When we gather for worship, we heed God's call and honor our need for Sabbath and rest. When we enter into silence, we attune our hearts and open our minds to a presence greater than our own. As we begin this short period of meditation, I encourage you to bring your full self to this present moment. Set aside any distractions, lay down your burdens, and take a deep, life-giving breath. God is with us. Let us reflect upon the week that has passed. What are the joys we have celebrated? And what concerns have we endured? Are there things we have done that we ought not to have done? And are there things we have left undone that we ought to have done? As we look forward to the week ahead, what help will we need from God or neighbor? And what can we do to nurture love of God and love of neighbor in the world? We'll close in prayer. Source of life, for the joys we have celebrated, we give you thanks. God of compassion, for the concerns we have endured, please tend our hearts. Spirit of justice, for those things we have misdone, transform us with your love. Companion God, as we look forward to the week ahead, be ever present with us. And great lover of all, as we seek to nurture love of God and neighbor in the world, guide our actions and our prayers. Amen.
In Matthew's gospel, Jesus says, come to me. All you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, no matter what they are. And so I encourage you to set down your burdens and come. Come to the extravagant love, mercy, and forgiveness offered by God that is love. Set down your burdens and allow yourself to be forgiven. Because that can be the hardest thing of all. And now held in the arms of this God who is both father and mother, we pray together the prayer of Jesus, our brother. Mother, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So I now invite you all to unmute. Oh, goodness. Um, let's see, Kelly is telling me that something's wrong with screen sharing. It was just for the last bit, Ellen. I think it went to the whole PowerPoint slide rather than the most current one you had up, that's all. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, sorry about that. Um, so it was just for the- um... Lord's Prayer and what we just sang. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. All right. But you were able to hear the um okay, wonderful. Thank you. Peace be with you, Ellen. <laughs> Holly, peace be with all of you. And please feel free to unmute and share the peace and love of God with one another. Peace be with you. 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 Hello there. Well, everybody. Happy MLK Day. Hello, Lee and Ed. Happy MLK Sunday. I, I want to bring you to the attention of all of you, Nicholas's background. That's right, Nick. You've got the you've got the background of the day. <laughs> Way to go, Nicholas. We love it. Yes. And you. Absolutely. Hello. Absolutely. So um so yes, welcome everyone. And um I'll now invite you to mute and we'll share our peace prayer. <clears throat> Placing our hands across our hearts. Then repeat after me. May peace and health be with me. May peace and health be with this congregation. May peace and health be with our city and our country. May peace and health be with this entire world. Amen. All right, so now I'm going to invite everyone who is under the age of 15 to join me. And so um, I see Joseph, so I'm going to spotlight him and I'll spotlight myself to be with Joseph. 
And any, any children who would like to participate in children's time with me, um, turn on your screen so I can see you and I'll add you to our children's time screen. Hi, is that Charlie or Olivia? Your screen's too small yet, but I'm gonna spotlight you. There we go, okay, hi. And let's see, who else might we have here who would like to join us? Any other, ooh, yes, okay. Well, I see some more children, hello. Greetings, it's good to see you. And let's see if there's anyone else. All right, so if I'm missing anybody, I want you to unmute and shout out, okay? Because I don't want to miss anybody. And it is wonderful to see all of you. So let's see, I think first I wanna say, um, hmm, Livy, did you know that I was at your mom and dad's wedding? <laughs> Say that again. Say no. <laughs> you didn't know that? I was. I was at your mom and dad's wedding and it was really fun. <laughs> and uh, hey, what did you what were you gonna say? But I wasn't there yet. I know, I know. That is the that's the biggest bummer about weddings is that sometimes the kids are there, but a lot of times they're not. Not fair. So you know what? You have to tell them to have like an amazing 10th anniversary party. Okay, so that you can like go to a version of their wedding. Okay. If I remember correctly, I was there too. You were too, Nick. You totally were there. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yes, you were. All right. So has anybody else who is on the screen with me been to a wedding? Has anybody attended a wedding? Joseph hasn't. Okay, is that is that Elizabeth or Willa? My name is Willa. Hi, Willa. So you've been to a wedding. Whose wedding was it? My my uncle Jonathan's wedding and my aunt Patty's. My, right. my, my uncle Jonathan's wedding. Uncle Jonathan and Aunt Patty got married. All right. Was it fun? I was a baby. Oh, you were a baby. But you do not remember it. Because that's okay. I can tell you're not a baby now, though, because I see you've lost a tooth. That's exciting. Zachary, how about you? Have you ever been to a wedding? Yeah? Okay. Was it fun? Do you remember it? I should ask first. No. I think no? it was you don't remember it? Okay, that's fine. How about you, Char I mean, Livy, how about you? Have you ever been to a wedding? I know you weren't at your mom and dad's wedding, but have you ever been to one? Oh, wait, it's muted still. Robin, your screen is still muted. All right, can you hear us? Yep, now we can. Okay. Um, I've been to Stephanie's wedding. Ooh, do you remember it? Uh-huh. Okay, and was it was it fun? Mm-hmm. Was there dancing? Mm -mm. No dancing. <laughs> oh it, was a, it was a COVID wedding, wasn't it? Oh, it was a COVID wedding. Okay. Well, you know what? I can assure you that there was dancing at your mom and dad's wedding. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. You just ask your dad to show you his moves. All right. <laughs> All right. Cause that's like the most embarrassing thing that dad dance. <laughs> All right, so I think we have established that everybody, except for Joseph, I think, has been to a wedding at one point or another. Um, we've established that at least some weddings, meaning non-COVID weddings, do actually have dancing. And what you probably don't know is why I'm talking about weddings today. We're not doing a wedding. But the Bible story that we're going to read in just a little bit is actually about a wedding. It's about a wedding that Jesus went to with his mom. And it's a really kind of crazy story because that wedding ran out of wine. This is a wedding where there happened to be wine served. And they ran out of wine. And way back in the day, 2000 years ago, wine was considered sort of a symbol of abundance and blessing and celebration. And so if you ran out of wine at a wedding, that was not a good thing. So Jesus, so the story goes, turned a huge amount of water. I will tell you exactly how much in my sermon, a huge amount of water 
into wine. And you know what I'm guessing happened after that? I'm guessing there was a lot of dancing. So you know what we're gonna do right now? We're gonna dance, all right? Have, you, have any of you ever heard the song, Lord of the Dance? Maybe you have gone to the Christmas Revels. It's always at the Christmas Revels if you ever go. But even if you haven't, I think that you will probably recognize the tune. And I'm going to encourage everyone here either to stand up and dance, or if you're like me and you're on like a bouncy ball chair, you can just sit where you are and dance. Okay, all right, here we go. And, um, Kelly, shout out if I don't have the right screen, okay? Thank you. I'm gonna share screen here. Is it working this time? We got the right screen? Awesome. All right, here we go. that going again. Here we go. All right, well, I don't know about you, but well, I'm gonna ask you. Hey, Charlie, good to see you. Did anybody have fun dancing? Wave your hands if you did. I did. I had fun. Awesome, I'm so glad because it's for all ages. All right, well, it's good to see everyone close up and I look forward to continuing to see you the rest of the service, but right now I'm gonna remove your spotlights so that we can actually hear that story about Jesus and turning water into wine. And I believe that Miss Jane is going to do our reading this morning from 1 Corinthians, Paul's letter to the first Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, and from the Gospel of John. Okay. 
1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 11. Spiritual gifts. God's various gifts are handed out everywhere, but they all originate in God's spirit. God's various ministries are carried out everywhere, but they all originate in God's spirit. God's various expressions of power are in action everywhere, but God is behind it all. Each person is given something to do that shows who God is. Everyone gets in on it. Everyone benefits. All kinds of things are handed out by the Spirit and to all kinds of people. The variety is wonderful. Wise counsel, clear understanding, simple trust, healing the sick, miraculous acts, proclamation, distinguishing between spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues. All these gifts have a common origin, but are handed out one by one by the spirit of God. God decides who gets what and when. Second John one to 11, from water to wine. Three days later, there was a wedding in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. Jesus and his disciples were guests also. When they started running low on wine at the wedding banquet, Jesus' mother told him, they're just about out of wine. Jesus said, is that any of our business, mother? Yours or mine? This isn't my time. Don't push me. She went ahead anyway, telling the servants, whatever he tells you, do it. Six stoneware water pots were there, used by the guests for ritual washings. Each held 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus ordered the servants, fill the pots with water, and they filled them to the brim. Now, fill your pitchers and take them to the host, Jesus said, and they did. When the host tasted the water that had become wine, he didn't know what had just happened, but the servants, of course, knew. He called out to the bridegroom, everybody I know begins with their finest wine, and after their guests have had their fill, brings in the cheap stuff. But you've saved the best till now. This act in Cana of Galilee was the first sign Jesus gave, the first glimpse of his glory and his disciples believed in him. Thank you so much, Jane. All right. Well, as we know, every story starts somewhere. And in the New Testament, each gospel begins someplace different. For instance, only Matthew and Luke contain nativity narratives, while all four gospels contain a baptism story. Each one of them has a unique, significant public event that announces Jesus to his community. In Mark, it's when Jesus casts out a demon, demonstrating his intention to thwart anything that prevents us from experiencing abundant life. In Matthew, it's when he preaches the Sermon on the Mount, kind of like a new Moses bringing God's commandments from the mountaintop. And in Luke, Jesus reads from the Torah in his hometown synagogue, proclaiming in the words of Isaiah, release for the captive and good news for the poor. In every story, first things matter, writes David Lose. So how about John's gospel? Jesus goes to a wedding, and turns a lot of water into wine. What? Well, let's start with a little information about first century weddings. As Debbie Thomas writes, in the ancient world, wedding feasts lasted for days, and it was the host's sacred responsibility to provide abundant food and drink for the duration of the festivities. To run out of wine early was a dishonor and a disgrace a breach of hospitality that the guests would remember for years. Or in David Losa's words, to run out of wine at a first century wedding would not have been just embarrassing, but disastrous. 
Wine was associated with blessing, joy, goodness, and more. To run out of wine would have felt like a curse, like you'd run out of blessing. Remember, folks couldn't just run out to a local Trader Joe's, assuming you live in DC and not Maryland, and buy an extra case, even if they had the money. And it's doubtful this was the wedding of a well-to-do couple. Neither Jesus nor his mother came from such a background, meaning it was likely hosted by another working class family from Nazareth. So there's Jesus with his mom, perhaps accompanied by some other family members or even a few early followers. And the wedding party runs out of wine. It's Mary who notices, though John's gospel gives her no name. It's Mary who realizes a family is about to be shamed for not blessing the wedding couple with abundance. And Jesus's reply, it's not my time. Which could either mean I don't feel like dealing with this or I'm not ready for people to know who I am. But his mother begs to differ even though she's not ready, she knows he is. So she confidently says to the servers, do what he tells you, which is when Jesus instructs them to refill their huge stoneware jugs, the ones used for Jewish ritual hand washing with water and to serve, to fill the serving pitchers from there. 150 gallons, not of the cheap stuff usually brought out at the end of a party or for the people at the lowest tables, but the best wine for everyone, no matter their status or whether they'd been invited or who or how they were. There were many leftovers of the people. Those are few who bought. Yet why the centrality of wine? A good question, especially in our day and age, when we know abundant wine is not always a good thing. Well, in the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament, wine is often used as a symbol of the joy and celebration associated with salvation and the image of a wedding banquet as a picture of the restoration of Israel. Thus, John's first century Jewish community would have understood both as signs that Jesus, the person who saved the day at the wedding, was here to save and restore us. As Elizabeth Johnson writes, Jesus's extravagant miracle of changing the water into wine is a sign that in him, life, joy, and salvation have arrived. Quick Bible study aside. In John's gospel, there are seven signs, semion in Greek, that Jesus is the long-awaited one. In the first chapter of this gospel are the words, in him was life, and that life was the light of all people. And later Jesus will say, I have come that they might have life and have it in abundance. So this is a theme. But what does it mean? What is the abundance of Jesus, and why does John begin with a focus on it? Well, let's first be clear. The abundance is for everyone, not just a chosen few spiritually or economically. As Alicio Perez Alvarez puts it, Jesus takes the side of the poor groom and bride who ran out of wine in the middle of the fiesta. The Nazarene clinks glasses of wine with folks who are exhausted by poverty, telling them salut, cheers, skol, meaning salvation, humanization, healing. This is a theology of liberation. Next, this introductory story of John's reveals much about who Jesus is and what he's come to do. As Jan Richardson writes, his gesture is a harbinger of the bent toward plentitude that will mark his ministry. Again and again in the chapters to come, we will witness Jesus's persistence in entering places of lack lack of health, of justice, of wisdom, of wholeness, and offering abundance in its place. In sum, 
John offers us a story about extravagant, 150 gallons of wine, extravagant abundance for all, every one of us, no matter where we sit at the table or even if we're at the table. In fact, though John's gospel doesn't often use the phrase kingdom or reign of God, this is a wonderful image of that reign. As the other three gospels would put it, God's reign or kingdom is like a village wedding celebration to which everyone is invited and at which the guests are surprised by the abundance and quality of the wine. So what does it all mean for us? Well, I don't know about you, but I haven't been feeling very abundant lately. Maybe it's the cold 14 degrees when I woke up this morning, or gray, or COVID, or politics, or climate change, or concern about certain loved ones. I'm sure we each have our list, and it can make us feel tight, constricted, like resources are scarce, love is limited, and goodwill rarely to be found. We can find ourselves pulled in, walled off, protected in ways that don't serve us or others. Of course, part of it is COVID. We're meant to be distancing right now, protecting ourselves and others and our hospital systems from this disease. And part of it is winter. A time when our bodies naturally want to hibernate, even when the world is shouting, come on, it's a new year, the holidays are over, get back to work. As if we hadn't been working all December. But I think this inclination to draw in, protect ourselves, perceive scarcity, is bigger than just winter or Omicron or politics or climate change. It's a spiritual state. And it's what Jesus came to shock us out of. I've come that you might have life and have it in abundance. John's gospel is proclaiming this, telling a story about a wedding to get the point across. Remember, the story begins with lack. Noticed by Mary because mothers watch for what's missing. They're out of wine. Though it could have been they're out of patience or healthcare or food. They're out of joy or options. She names the lack. And Jesus, though grumpily at first, steps in to show the reality of abundance. It makes me wonder if this is what belief is all about. Meaning we don't believe in Jesus. We believe in his, in God's abundance. We believe abundance trumps scarcity. We choose to live in a world, God's reign, where there's enough. Which means everyone should have enough. And we're called to help with the distribution. Now, I'm not just referring to money or even housing or food, though I do believe in material redistribution. I'm including the spiritual gifts, such as hope, peace, and joy. As Marge Piercy once wrote, a little Saturday night and not too much Monday morning. My point is that we're part of the abundance. In John's story, Jesus didn't perform the miracle alone. He had a whole bunch of servers, yes, food service workers, to help him, each of them carrying a heavy stone jar or basin that held 25 gallons of water or wine. So as I sit here this frigid Sunday morning, wondering in what direction our country is going, what the heck the COVID virus will do next and why we're not getting a good snowstorm instead of a slushy icy mess. 
I consider abundance and I stop. I stop and ask myself, where? Where is this extravagant abundance I believe God is all about? And I open myself because when I do, here it is. My work, which I love, the huge trees that rise above my home, the two dogs that accompany my every move, my son's decision to stay in treatment, your willingness to make the life of this church happen, every person who has contributed food, clothing, money to help others in this tough season, the 30 children and youth in our church, each participating in their own way, all known and loved. Your openness to looking around and within as we continue to assess our congregation's relationship with racial justice. Anyone who braves the slush for tomorrow's MLK walk for voting rights. Our capacity for compassion. Our ability to change. This is just a short list. I could easily have gone on and I suggest you do. Make a longer list that is. Where do you find the extravagant abundance this story tells us God is all about? I challenge you to write down at least 50 things. It's a gratitude count with a shift. A shift toward amazement toward the wow Anne Lamott names when she says there are three types of prayer, help, thanks, wow. I'm asking you to consider the awe in the word God. Consider the awe. Open yourselves to abundance. Be part of the miracle that brings life to all people. As Jen Richardson writes, and I conclude, as you pray or yearn or ache for needed miracles in your life or in the life of another, are there marvels that God is already up to? Might the miracle be coming in a different form than you expect? And can you let yourself see it? How might God be inviting you to participate in the working out of a wonder in the life of another? How do you keep yourself open to the surprising gifts, the sharp, sweet wine that God is conniving to bring? Amen. I now invite Callie to share our joys and our concerns. It is now the time in our service when we share our deep joys and concerns silently or out loud or in the chat with God and with one another. God, hear our healing prayers for Congregation Beth Israel in Dallas after yesterday's hostage situation. Jane's friend, Mike, his wife and daughter as he undergoes chemotherapy for stage two pancreatic cancer. John's sister, Jill, as she continues her treatment for leukemia. Tyler's friend, Heidi, plus strength, patience and fortitude of spirit for everyone in their family, including the caregivers. Alan's colleague, Billy, who's unvaccinated and hospitalized with COVID. The Hyde Palu family in Charlottesville, son Ben has COVID in New Hampshire, daughter Emma's fiance, George, plus three doctors with whom she delivers babies all have COVID. Elizabeth's cousin who was recently diagnosed with lymphoma. 
we add Holly's prayer for all Jewish people who are scared to worship in community. God, hear our prayers for Don M's family as they grieve the death of his father, Miriam Collins, former member of our congregation who is 103 and in hospice care, Dorothy and her family after the death of her mother, Georgie, Kim and her daughter, Zara, who has now been gone longer than she was alive, the family of Holly's friend who recently died, Celestin to receive an old vehicle so he can ship goods that have been that have been donated for his community overseas. All those, all of us affected by COVID. Anyone, anywhere who is sick or grieving or in need. God, we give thanks for the DC government's efficient and well-organized efforts to provide COVID self-testing kits to DC residents. Warm homes, fuzzy socks, and the gift of shelter. The National Cathedral's 4 p.m. Sunday even song. And all that DC public libraries are offering right now for the good of the whole. We add another joy from Alan, who is grateful to Ellen and Lee for leading a lively and informative book discussion on Ellen's new book, new novel. I'll just hold one moment in case there are any last minute joys or concerns that we can hold together. Let us take a moment of silence to hold these joys and concerns and to share any others in the chat. Let us pray. Loving God, listen to the prayers of your people. Comfort and nourish us in both our joys and our concerns, spoken or unspoken, and hold us tenderly as we face the many different experiences that life and being human can bring. Holy and gracious spirit, we are grateful for your presence as we move into this new week a time that will bring forth its own sorrows and joys. Remind us to hold one another in love and prayer, reaching out as we are able to lend a hand, offer support, or share in celebration. We give thanks for the blessing of this congregation in our lives and pray that we might be a blessing in return. In your compassionate name, amen. Thank you, Callie. I invite you all to hold these joys and concerns in your heart as you listen to Latia sing where the spirit of the Lord is. Where the spirit of the Lord is.
With much gratitude to Latia for that beautiful song. And for those of you who don't live in the DC area um, and may not recognize it, that is the Fred Frederick Douglass Bridge that goes across the Potomac um, from, well, it's right near the Nationals baseball stadium um, across over into Anacostia, which is um, a majority black and very low income section of the city ward eight. And that is where tomorrow's MLK March for Voting Rights will take place. Sam, I believe you're going to introduce our offering. Yes, good morning, everyone. Now is the time in our service when we receive the offering in grateful appreciation for the life and work of this beloved community. During this time when we are physically apart, all of our expenses remain. To support the ongoing work of our church, I ask that you please continue to give via mail or on our website as you are able. The donate link has been put in the chat room if you'd like to give now. And if you have any difficulty, please email John Tishy, our assistant treasurer, who would be happy to help. And his email address is also in the chat room. I now invite you to take a moment of silence an appreciation for the gift of this church and its many blessings in our lives. And now please join in singing the doxology. Now, please join me for our closing hymn, a song that includes all of the different um, events that take place during the season of Epiphany.
And so as we go our separate ways this morning, I'd like to leave you with these words, this poem prayer by my colleague, Laura Martin. It's called Instructions for Anxious Days. Remember what has carried you here through other times when the earth shook. Chop vegetables, create with your hands, stay close to something that reminds you of laughter. Hold a book, release a prayer. Pick up a strand with someone that you had dropped. Go into a field without any agenda but your presence. Believe that even now the earth is moving towards spring and something that has been closed will open again and the blossom will be extravagant. Please join me in our sung benediction. before I play our postlude, um, or I should say before I play Harold playing our postlude, <laughs> I will not be playing our postlude. <laughs> um, but before we listen to this amazing um, piece in honor of um, Martin Luther King Jr. Sunday, um, I want to invite anyone who would like to stay on to chat just for a bit afterwards to do so. Um, and then I believe that um, I think if I'm right, we actually don't have any groups meeting after church today. <laughs> so um, just we can enjoy staying on for a bit with one another. <laughs> 